Jersey TV. I've already told you a little bit about Fred Stoker, one of the authors of Every Man's Battle. Again, this battle transcends fighting your natural, God-given inclinations. This is every religious exercise. That's why this is such a helpful study. I'm going to read another passage from my book. I could probably read the whole book and be happy as punch, but um, I'm just going to read this last section. I plan on being back in the studio on Monday, so I don't want to waste a lot of time telling you about my tooth issue, except I might not be able to get back in to have the bottom tooth pulled until Wednesday. I'm praying. I know prayer doesn't change things, but God says make your requests known to Him, and I'm praying that I can get in tomorrow. If they have a cancellation, they're going to call me down in uh, Miami. If you could all gather in prayer circles, it would be much appreciated because we all know that God just doesn't respond to prayer squares. I vacillate between unbearable pain and my, my swelling has gone down a little bit, I think. You see it there, but I vacillate between unbearable pain and then when the oxycodone kicks in, I get some relief for a couple hours. But as I said, nothing compared to what some of you folks endure. So this is Martin Sender. Welcome to MZTV. I'm going to read a quote from Stephen Arterburn. He's another writer. He's the other co-author of the book, Every Man's Battle. This is a study in religious exercise. These are grown men who have read their Bibles many, many times and have no idea of the sacrifice of Christ. This is the phenomenon we talk about often, how people can read and read and read and never come to a realization of the truth. It is a proof that there is such a thing as religious lust. You feel the temptation to fight and you want to join the other people who fight. It's like a battle cry. It's the cry to battle, and it's very populated because people like this, and people are pumping each other up, like the Promise, Promise Keepers movement back in the 80s or 90s. I think it was in the 80s. A bunch of men in stadiums, just they, st they still think they're playing high school football, and they're going to beat Satan, and they're, they're like doing exercises, pumping their fists and swearing at Satan, whatever obnoxious, uh, useless exercise they do. And Satan is actually delighted. He's delighted that uh, he lives rent free, free in their heads. Satan lives rent free in all these people's heads. Christ is nowhere in the vicinity. They voice his name. They have no idea what he has done. And they, they think it's their job to complete what Christ has done. Not, to, not even to complete it, but to do it. To do it, to overcome their sin, as if Christ didn't do anything. It, it's the most amazing phenomenon grown people grown men grown women who mouth the words Christ died for my sin mouth the words Jesus Christ took away the sins of the world and then try to take away their own sins as if like Fred Stoker said yesterday God will be so proud of us he'll be so proud of me he will shout with joy you will call Jesus to his side and say, look at Fred Stoker. Look what this man has accomplished. Just when you think this is a comic book written by a five-year-old, you realize that these men are for real. And they have seduced millions and millions of men into the battle. Men want to be seduced into the battle. They want to fight something. It's in people to want to fight, to want to win. And what these men don't realize is this is a battle the human beings were never meant to fight. That's why Jesus was crucified, because he fought this battle. But they act like nothing at all happened at the cross. Nothing at all happened. And this is the biggest insult to Jesus Christ I can possibly imagine. And yet this is an epidemic. It said, I, I realize more and more how satisfying it is for people to think that they're removing their own sin from their lives. And these people cannot help but become finger pointers, guilt bringers, accusing other people of not working as hard as them, like those sick, sickening quotes I read from Fred Stoker. Don't you want to get rid of your sin? Are you too weak? 
aren't you a real man? And many men are just weak need. Bunch of beta males and they take the bait and they join this stupid club. Listen to this. You haven't heard from Steeter you haven't heard from Steven Arterberg yet, so I'm gonna bring this to you. So why did I start writing a book? Because I felt deeply that if God would grant me such a voice in his kingdom, I could help give even more men some practical steps toward victory and to help set them free to help others. Dear Stephen, this is me. The most practical help you could have taken to free men spiritually would have been to quote them Romans 8.1. The Apostle Paul already wrote some great things on this topic, Stephen, but since you did not do this, I will. Here it is, quote, There is now therefore no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. This is victory, Stephen. And it was won by Jesus Christ on the cross, not by you bouncing your eyes from supposedly evil bra ads. These guys were really hung up by the bra ads. Women's brassiers. Really hung up on them. It's amazing that a piece of underwear would be standing in these men's minds. This is actual truth. A piece of women's underwear standing between them and acceptance by Christ. And I am not exaggerating. I, uh, I would love to read this whole book to you. You cannot believe the quotes that these men do. But I, I, I'm going to read some of it. This is me again. If you define victory from sin as bouncing the eyes and never looking at bra ads for the rest of one's life, then victory from sin waxes and wanes depending on one's own daily efforts and successes and one's willpower, I might add. It means that today one may be free from sin because of good behavior, but tomorrow one misbehaves and loses one's freedom from sin. God likes a particular man today, but tomorrow he frowns upon the same man, all based upon the man's behavior. Is this the way you see it? Apparently so. Quote from Stephen Arterburn again. The following verse, wait until you hear this. It's not a verse, it's a passage. The following verse inspired me to keep plotting away on this book night after night, month after month. Oh, what a hero you are, Stephen Arterburn. What a martyr, suffering so that you might bring millions of men into a battle they were never meant to fight. The real battle is battling these religious hypocrites, battling these people still living in the Stone Age. That's the true battle, is to resist any temptation toward religious lust. But I'm telling you, it's got, it's got to be like a drug. And as I said, back in 1979-80, I, I felt it for a little while. I, I felt that drug of carrying the scriptures and seeing myself as a person who took God seriously and uh, trying to le lead an upright life. I mean, it even affects your posture when you think you're better than everyone else. It affects your posture. Your posture. This is why people have their noses in the air. That's why we get that phrase from, because people literally do have their noses in the air. They're not like the sinner Jesus described, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. No, they are so proud and arrogant. Oh, you plotted away on this book, you saintly man, building trap after trap, condemnation trap after condemnation trap for men, seducing them into a battle they were never meant to fought, sounding the trumpet, to accomplish something that Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago already accomplished. Here is the passage that Stephen Arterburn had tacked up by his computer and he read it every day. It's from Psalm 51, verses 1 and 12 and 13. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Restore me to the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will turn back to you. 
This is still Stephen's comment now on that verse. Get it? God's plan is to set sinners free and then use them to teach others. God has been using me in just that way and I trust he will use you as well. God has been using you to do what, Stephen? To first of all, tell men, tell human beings that they have to set themselves free. Not declaring to them, for freedom Christ frees them, not declaring to them, there's now therefore no more condemnation in Christ Jesus. But God's plan is to ongoing future according to this future voice here, to set sinners free and then use them to teach others. My comment, what can we say about a man who sets himself up as a teacher of sinners who has not even realized that Jesus Christ's death on a cross saved the world from sin, condemnation, and death? What can we say about a man who constantly refers to a verse from the Old Testament written during a time when people gathering sticks on the Sabbath got stoned, when God required people to kill bulls and lambs and goats for their sins, when penitents relied upon the efforts of a high priest, who himself, the high priest, entered with fear and trembling once a year into the Holy of Holies, hoping to avoid death by dressing correctly. Is this a man we can trust? To fuel and inspire himself to write his portion of a book introducing men to a monumental battle against flesh that they were never even supposed to fight, this man concentrates on and is inspired by a passage of scripture showing King David begging for mercy and praying to have his transgressions blotted out. Is there anything wrong with King David begging for mercy and praying to have his transgressions blotted out? No, not at all. Neither was there anything wrong with Noah building an ark. The thing is, ark building is out of God's timing today, as is begging for mercy. David lived before the coming of Christ. I think this news would actually be a shocking revelation to these guys. King David, as spiritual as he was in his day, had never read Romans 8.1. He had no clue that a human could be justified by faith. How could he? The coming of Christ was 1,000 years away. David lived during an era of, quote, do this or else, unquote. Stephen Arterburn can't claim David's excuse. Therefore, Stephen Arterburn is simply ignorant. He writes from a time warp, from a land far, far away. Trusting Stephen Arterburn to teach us about sin is like resurrecting Stonewall Jackson to teach us about combating terrorism or raising Copernicus for a seminar on the iPod. Arterburn is fighting sin with sticks, stones, and slingshots. David is dead, Stephen, and so is Moses. Mr. Arterburn, let me ask you this, sir. What if someone saved your son from drowning? Would you spend the rest of your life praying for your son to be saved from drowning? Would not this be like receiving a gift and then saying to the giver, where's my gift? What an insult to the giver. Your reliance on David disservices Christ. If only you had tacked up a passage from Romans next to your computer instead of Psalms, you would not have been forced to plot away on a book proposing law keeping as the answer to what you suppose to be sin. 
No wonder you plotted. I got depressed just reading your book. I cannot imagine the depression you must have felt writing it. So now you propose to teach others the wonderful, quote, liberty you have stumbled upon by reading the Old Testament, attempting Mosaic law, begging for forgiveness, and ignoring the cross? How wonderful. Thank you for the offer to help, Mr. Arterburn, but we don't need it. You may as well tell us to build an ark to circumcise our sons on the eighth day and explain to us the most efficient way to transport our sheep to Jerusalem. Mr. Arterburn, you're stuck in the Stone Age. Your book would be helpful if only you had written it in 1000 BC. Unfortunately, it's AD 2021. You're only 3,000 years behind the curve, Mr. Arterburn. No wonder you invite us to battle. You do not realize that the battle has been won. The war's over, Stephen. Wake up and smell the justification. Wake up and gaze and some really great bra ads. Those bra ads are pretty great, I must admit. So I've heard. Just when one might hope that maybe Fred Stoker gets a glimpse into the grace of God, a glimpse eclipsing that of Stephen Arterburn, one discovers that Fred is in fact the worse off of the two. The only people worse off than Stephen and Fred are the poor souls cajoled into reading what amounts to the Law of Moses on steroids minus testosterone. Fred Stoker. Ah, Fred Stoker. Fred Stoker's very first section titled Wall of Separation is about the wall between God and Fred that has been created by Fred. It happened every Sunday morning during our church worship service. I'd look around and see other men with their eyes closed, freely and intensely worshiping the God of the universe. Me? I sensed only a wall of separation between me and the Lord. Okay, so what was the cause of this wall of separation between God and Fred? Let me quote Fred again, if you can stand it. I continued to feel that distance from God during the Sunday morning worship services. The true reason for that distance slowly dawned on me. Oh, the revelations of this man, they are so great. There was a hint of sexual impurity in my life. There was a monster lurking in my life. What was this hint of sexual immorality? This is me asking Fred, asking the reader, asking you. What was this hint of sexual immorality? What was the monster? Fred explains, it surfaced each Sunday morning when I settled in my comfy lazy boy and open the Sunday morning newspapers. I would quickly find the department store inserts and begin paging through the colored newsprint filled with models posing in bras and panties. Women's underwear, watch out. It's wrong, I admitted, but it's such a small thing it was a far cry from Playboy, I told myself. This is a real book I am quoting from. Fred's perceived sin, according to him, continually kept God at arm's length. We know that this distance and wall of separation between God and Fred was on Fred's side of the window pane, not God's, but Fred did not see it that way. Oh, no. Fred Stoker. 
by worldly standards, I was doing just great. Just one little problem. By God's standard of sexual purity, I wasn't even close to living His vision for marriage. Marriage. What does this have to do with marriage? I don't know. But anyway, let's go on. My father had higher hopes for me than I had dreamed. You dream about God's high hopes for you? I think I would rather dream about those bra ads. I could never look God in the eye. I could never fully worship Him. I continued feeling distance from God. Poor Fred. Every Sunday morning he dashed God's high hopes for him. God's standard for sexual purity was way beyond not looking at Playboy magazine. Fred never looked at Playboys. He did get credit for that, at least. Even so, he still, quote, wasn't even close to living God's vision for him. What would be close? You ask? Giving up the newspaper ads, of course. Then Fred would be close. If only Fred could give up the newspaper ads. He would arrive at a proximity to God available only to the people at his church who, due to their states of perfection, could worship God exuberantly. But because Fred continued to disappoint God each and every Sunday morning, God could not fully look upon Fred and Fred could not fully look upon God. Fred Stoker. People around me disagreed, saying, Okay, come on. Nobody can control their eyes and mind, for heaven's sakes. God loves you. There's a couple of somewhat enlightened people in this man's church. For all the efforts of his friends, Fred could not stop looking inward toward himself for the answer to his agony. Fred never could see past himself to set his eyes upon Christ. For some reason, Fred could not escape the debilitating self-occupation of measuring his flesh against what he imagined to be God's pure and holy standard. Fred Stoker. But I knew differently. My prayer life was feeble. I had no faith in my own prayers because of my sin. I had no peace. I was paying a price for my sin. Paying a price? Where have I heard that? Oh, Jesus paid a price. Fred's friends no doubt tried to tell him that Christ had paid the price for his sin. Christ had suffered and died the most horrible death imaginable for the sake of Fred's failure with the newspaper ads. Fred must have known this intellectually. Everything else in Fred's life, everything else, was pure and perfect, according to Fred. We can only assume this since the thing with the bras and the panties and the newspapers was the only flaw truly troubling Fred. It was this one continuing nagging flaw that beset him and ruined everything else in his life that was so perfectly aligned to the righteousness of God. It was this one flaw. What a, what a deceived man. It was just, just this one flaw keeping Fred's relationship with God from being everything God hoped it would be. It must have been so frustrating for Fred to be such a small step away from perfection. So near and yet so far, one step away from a life of obedience that would at last allow him to look his heavenly father in the eye with confidence. Fred again. Every week I said I wouldn't look at those ad inserts, but every Sunday morning the striking 
photos compelled me. The distance from God grew wider. My impurity still ruled. My impurity still ruled. Thought Christ ruled. No. In Fred's mind, as far as I know, this man has not changed in the 25 years since this book was written. Fred's impurity ruled. And if the man has never looked at a single bra ad from that time to this in the last 25 years, then it is still not Christ and his purity that saved Fred. It is Fred's resisting his perceived impurity. The one thing that ruined his perfect life. His friends gave up. It was Christ who ruled. But Fred could not get it out of his head that his own impurity trumped that. I know Fred's friends gave up because Fred ended up co-authoring a book with Stephen Arterburn called Every Man's Battle, offering men a step-by-step -step procedure for engaging in a lifelong battle against an enemy that Satan, not God, had set up for men to conquer. What a beautiful trap of Satan. Satan set up this trap and he set it up for millions and millions of people. Not just this trap, but the trap of avoiding alcohol, avoiding smoking, all these little sins. It's Satan that has set this up. Because Satan is the liar and the father of lies. And he has set up these little nagging things in people's lives that they've been convinced because of church, because of pastors, because of false teachers that they have to overcome in order to look God in the eye and for God to look at them. Where's Christ? Where's the cross? Somewhere way off in the distance. It doesn't apply. Christ's victory does not apply. This is nothing less than a self-won salvation. If you think this book is a cartoon, and it sounds like it to us because we're far, far, far beyond this. We stole the cross. This goes on in churches every single day. In Wednesday night Bible studies, people write books all the time about religious lust, this lust to eliminate sin from their lives. It, it seems impossible to us. It seems the ultimate stupidity. But I'm telling you, we are rare. So diabolical is our enemy. It's incredible what Satan has done with these people. And they write books. What did his friends know anyway? They were weak and compromising. They had settled for mediocrity like the quote I read from you yes I read for you yesterday where they had failed Fred would succeed Fred was at a crossroads he could listen to his friends who had surely become the voice of Satan in his life how ironic Fred's inner dialogue to perfect himself was the true voice of Satan or he could go his own way and answer the call to, quote, total purity, unquote. That's a quote from the man. Total purity. Fred Stoker. Since Christians don't read their Bibles very often, you should try it sometime, Fred. Since Christians don't read their Bibles very often, many men have no clue about God's standard for sexual purity. Classic example, isn't it? Yes, Fred's is a classic example of a man struggling against law. Like everyone else in history who has received a whiff of the glory, perfection, and righteousness of God, Fred became acutely aware of what he considered to be sin in his life. Some people are murdering people and raping women, but at least Fred was only looking at lingerie ads. I'm not belittling him. I'm pitying 
him. I think we can all feel his pain, self-imposed though it is. Fred was a failure to God and knew it. Whatever a man thinks is sin, it is sin to that man. Now everything which is not out of faith is sin, Romans 14, 23. We have all felt this way at one time or another. It is called the conviction of sin. We know we are big fat losers as we stand before a righteous God. It's a terrible feeling. The Apostle Paul struggled just like Fred. Paul's cry and Fred's sound hauntingly similar. Fred writes on page 19 of Every Man's Battle, Every week I'd vow to avoid watching R-rated sexy movies when I traveled, but every week I'd fail sweating out tough battles and always losing. Every time I gazed at some glistening jogger, I'd promise to never do it again, but I always did. Paul writes in Romans 7, 17 through 23 from the message, For if I knew the law but still can't keep it, and if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. This is Paul from the message. It's a paraphrase, but it's pretty good here. Romans 7, 17 through 23. I realize that I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. My decisions, such as they are, don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. I truly delight in God's commands, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. That was Paul. Like Fred, the Apostle Paul had discovered a connection between his failures and the distance from God. This is where Paul and Fred part company. For they reach radically different conclusions as to what might cure the problem. Paul discovered the problem to be, quote, the power of sin within me. Something had gone wrong deep within me. <clears throat> That's Paul. The apostle is so despairing of his ability to please God that he arrives at the low point of his dilemma when he finally says, I realize that I don't have what it takes. Fred does not quite see it as that deep of a problem. Fred says, I had merely found a middle ground, somewhere between paganism and obedience to God's standard. Rather than giving up, as Paul does, Fred hears a battle cry. If only Fred can obey God's standard, then everything will be restored. If Fred can just overcome the lingerie ads, he will probably at the same time overcome the R-rated movies and the glistening joggers. If only he can overcome these things, he will at last be able to regain confidence in his prayers and will finally be able to look God in the eye. He will finally have attained obedience to God's holy standard. Like Paul, Fred had tried everything. Nothing helped. Like Paul, he eventually came to the end of his rope. When Paul came to the end of his rope, he added one of the most pertinent questions a human can ask. Listen to the cry of the apostle in verse 24 of Romans chapter 7, again from the message. I've tried everything and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? 
Yes, that is the real question. It is the most important question that can be asked. Is there no one who can do anything for me? The answer to this question is vital to our lasting peace. The apostle reaches a profound answer. The question again is, is there no one who can do anything for me? Here is Paul's answer. Paul's answer in verse 25. The answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. He acted to set things right in this life of contradictions when I want to serve God with all my heart and mind but am pulled by the influence of sin to do something totally different. The concordant literal New Testament says it this way, A wretched man am I. What will rescue me out of this body of death? Grace. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Fred also answers the question, is there no one who can do anything for me? Or as the CLNT has it, what will rescue me out of this body of death? At stake with both Paul and Fred is nothing less than God's acceptance of them. At stake is nothing less than the ability to look God in the eye with peace and settled assurance. Paul realizes his condition is not only desperate, but hopeless. Looking deeply, he finds nothing within himself to answer the bell for another round of struggle against sin. This surrender and lack of self-confidence is a shocking confession from an ex-Pharisee who once testified concerning himself and am I even having confidence in the flesh also? If any other one is presuming to have confidence in the flesh, I rather. In circumcision, the eighth day of the race of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in relation to law, a Pharisee, in relation to zeal, persecuting the ecclesias, in relation to the righteousness which is in law, becoming blameless. But things that were gained to me, that were gained to me, these I have deemed a forfeit, because of Christ. But to be sure, I am also deeming all to be a forfeit because of the superiority and the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, because of whom I forfeit all and am deeming it to be refuse that I should be gaining Christ. In his own eyes, Paul used to be blameless. In those days of self-imagined purity, however, Paul had not even begun his walk of grace. Interesting that the same place of self-delusion, blameless, from which Paul launches to appreciate true freedom, Fred makes his goal. Let me read that again. Interesting that the same place of self-delusion, that is, I'm becoming blameless, from which Paul launches, from which Paul launches to appreciate true freedom, Fred makes his goal. This is what Fred wants to become, blameless. Fred's dream is to land at the place Paul now considers garbage or refuse, Philippians 3.8, in light of the greater revelation, which is grace. A wretched man am I, Paul says. What will rescue me out of this body of death? Grace, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul's revelation causes him to laud Jesus Christ rather than his own successes against sin. He exalts in the answer to his personal trauma and failure. Grace, to Paul, the battle has ended. He is still pulled by the influence of sin, but Christ has set things right in spite of his sin. And now Paul looks to him, Jesus Christ, his Savior. Fred, however, looks to himself. Paul's answer is grace, and Jesus Christ acted to set things right. Fred's answer, however, is much different than Paul's. 
Fred heard his friend's pleas, but in the end decided to go his own way, distancing himself from the counsel of his associates. The God loved him no matter what. Well, Christians don't read their Bibles very often, Fred said of his associates. The light, quote unquote, the light, air quotes, finally dawned on Fred. He now knew why God was stonewalling him. Fred Stoker, I finally made the connection between my sexual immorality and my distance from God. I looked pure on the outside to everyone else, but to God I had stopped short. I merely found a middle ground somewhere between paganism and obedience to God's standard. Well, there it was then. There it was then. To God, I'd stop short. God was expecting so much of Fred. Fred had not gone far enough. Like the apostle, Fred knew he was at a crossroads. He could either give up and relax in God's grace, as did Paul, or double down and push his powers of self-control and asceticism to the brink. To Fred, the choice was easy. He would show his friends what was possible. Fred found his, air quotes, deliverance. Fred once again found the confidence in his own prayers that he used to have before looking at lingerie ads. In the good old days, before the ads, Fred had this self-confidence. He knew his prayers went purely to God. He knew it because he knew, air quotes again, that there was no sin in his life before the advent of lingerie ads. My prayer life was feeble. I had no faith in my own prayers because of my sin, Fred Stoker. One can only assume from this that Fred's faith was, or rather is, in his ability to pray. One can only assume that Fred's confidence in his own prayers hinged upon eliminating sin from his life. I had no peace. I was paying a price for my sin. Many would see the phrase, paying a price for my sin, and think of the Lord Jesus Christ. Fred does not think this way. In not one place in every man's battle does Fred Stoker even entertain the thought that Christ paid the price for his sin. And neither does Stephen Arterburn. Rather, quote, by God's standard of sexual purity, I wasn't even close to living his vision for marriage. To God, I'd stopped short. The distance from God grew wider. My impurity still ruled. From this foundation of sand, Fred instructs the doomed readers of his book to aim, these are all quotes from Fred Stoker, to aim for obedience is to aim for perfection, page 49. God is waiting for you to rise up and engage in the battle, page 92. Let's put together a battle plan, page 101. The landing craft ramps are falling open, and it's time to hit the beach, page 101. You'll be holy when you choose not to sin, page 92. By winning this war, your life will be blessed in tremendous ways, page 93. Your victory will recover what was lost through sin page 93. Your victory will help you regain and revitalize your relationship with God. Page 93. You can win this battle by training your eyes to bounce. Page 125. If you bounce your eyes for six weeks, you can win this war. Page 125. When your eyes bounce toward a woman, they must bounce away immediately. Page 125. So there's your battle plan. Setting up defense perimeters and choosing not to sin. 
page 105. Looking back at the details of our plan, even we will admit that it all sounds slightly crazy. Page 151. Slightly? This is yours truly to end this chapter. Paul's revelation caused him to give up, look to his Savior, and shout, Grace! Fred's revelation causes him to gear up for a war with his eyes and shout, Hit the beach! No wonder the key word in Fred's book title is battle. Whose plan would you rather follow? Paul's or Fred's? Which plan do you think has a chance of actually working? <laughs>